All right, well, it's 4.30, we'll get started here. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, my name's David Hollenberger, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about deploying and managing uh, PostgreSQL environments using Ansible. Um, I know it's uh, late in the day, it's last session. Thanks for hanging in there, and uh, it's really been a great conference. I've really enjoyed it. Um, so a little bit about myself, I'm a DBA. I work at Crew, and, and uh, we have um, been managing Postgres uh, environments for maybe two or three years now, so we're still relatively new. Um, it's been a great learning experience, and uh, really enjoy Postgres in general. It's, it's just a really good platform. Uh, so an agenda, uh, what I'd like to cover is uh, first why we need Ansible, why we're using it, uh, how it helps us, and, um, and then a little bit about just some of the introduction to Ansible, we'll call it Ansible 101, and then look at some more uh, practical examples about how Ansible can help you configure and manage uh, PostgreSQL and, and some extra um, utilities that are available. So a little background, like I said, we're, um, we're fairly new to Postgres. Um, me and my team of uh, you know, the DBAs, we uh, have traditionally managed Oracle databases, um, but as we have wanted to start migrating maybe some applications over to Postgres, uh, as well as, um, as we've started using AWS for more and more of our uh, web apps or mobile apps that we run um, in-house, then um, you know, Postgres really became a good option. Uh, we've really enjoyed the simplicity around setting up and managing Postgres um, compared to what we've been used to with more of the enterprise type uh, databases. It's uh, really a breath of fresh air. Um, and you know, we started out very simple. You know, single instance database running. You know, is on premise and um, life is good. There's there's not a whole lot of configuration there. Um, and we, you know, we had our uh, you know manually configured uh, database. We had shared documentation and some and some scripts to kind of uh, provision and um, get everything up and running. Um, but of course, you know, like most uh, environments. Um, Complexity increases, uh, requirements increase. Um, so we started looking at uh, streaming replication using uh, master standby, uh, and also looking at barman to, to help manage the backup and recovery situations and scenarios that we uh, wanted to really just ensure that um, we have a stable and, and available platform. And again, you know, thanks to really a lot of the simplicity around um, Postgres, it wasn't terribly difficult to, to really maintain this type of environment, uh, manually provisioning, um, copying and pasting scripts and commands. It wasn't too bad, but um, you know, as we started looking at even you know adding more layers to our infrastructure, um, looking at PG Bouncer for uh, session pooling and, and simple load balancing, uh, as well as you know not just we don't need just one Postgres cluster anymore, but there's multiple because you know more and more requests come in. Um, our uh, infrastructure in Amazon is growing rapidly. Um, we were quickly coming to the point where we uh, were realizing that just this manual provisioning um, was going to start just bogging down, um, you know, being able to handle additional requests or look at other utilities that, you know, are, are really one of the key components to, you know, Postgres is, you know, being able to try out all this other great utilities and um, extensions and resources that you have as part of this open source um, environment. Um, especially when you start looking at, you know, it's not just a single environment, but, you know, we've got dev and staging and production and, and lab environments and local environments. Um, you know, when you look at the operations side and just the overhead of uh, provisioning, installing, and managing this, as well as um, you know troubleshooting things and, and ensuring that the system in dev is at a consistent state and the same um, settings have been applied that are in our production database and knowing that things are consistent across the board, uh, it really becomes challenging. Uh, and, and when you start looking at you know maybe troubleshooting an issue or adding a new utility or something, you start looking at the documentation and you realize, man, this has become more complex than I, I, I guess I realize. You know, it's, um, you know, one component in and of itself is fairly simple, um, but when you start adding everything else, um, you know, it does become more complex than you'd really like. 
So we started looking at some, some options. And there's uh, a lot of options out there as far as configuration management utilities to help with uh, managing this environment. Um, you know, we've, we've already heard earlier today a great talk about uh, Chef and Puppet, and uh, those work really well. And um, we evaluated those for a period of time. Um, but my team, we, we are not from a development background, so we really felt like learning another language or managing, um, you know, some, some sort of central server was uh, a little more work than, than we wanted to do, at least for just testing something out and getting started. So we ran across Ansible, and uh, Ansible is an open source configuration management utility. Um, we were drawn to it immediately just by the simplicity that uh, it gave us as far as being able to define our infrastructure and code. Um, and, uh, you know, so as we looked at why, why we ended up choosing Ansible, um, like I said, there's a lot of other options. Um, you know, Chef and Puppet and SaltStack and, you know, many, many others, and uh, they all really do a good job. There's not, I wouldn't say there's a really a wrong choice, but um, there's a few things that, at least in our instant, in our case, um, made Ansible kind of stand out from the crowd. Uh, first, it was easy to get started. You know, like I said, we, um, we don't have, uh, you know, a deep programming um, background on, on the DBA team. We're primarily from more of an operations background and um, you know so being able to uh, kind of read the, the the ansible plays and the scripts that you create and understand it and even be able to hand it off to someone else who may not have a lot of experience in it either but have them be able to read it and at least at a high level uh, kind of understand what's going on was was really was really great so YAML is based on, or Ansible is based on uh, YAML, it's a markdown language, and Jinja. So instead of um, a programming language, it's a, it's a markdown language that uh, just organizes it very clearly, I think, and um, it makes it easy to understand. It also adds in, um, as you write your, your scripts in Ansible, um, your documentation is kind of built into these um, YAML files. And Jinja is used to, um, for, for templating configuration files, it, it adds in uh, just an ability to dynamically create a lot of um, config files that um, otherwise would be a lot of, you know, uh, instead of statically defining IPs or other um, settings, it's able to uh, create them um, using the variables that are, that are provided from Ansible. So, like I said, Ansible is also uh, open source. Um, this is another, you know, great thing about, um, you know, just being in the open source community. Like, there's a great uh, in, uh, community around it. They're actively developing it, much like Postgres. There's um, a lot of people using it to do really neat things. Uh, and also, uh, Ansible is agentless, so we don't have to have an agent running on the instances that we're trying to manage. Uh, it uses SSH to, to connect into those instances and manage them. So another concept in Ansible uh, that wasn't really a reason why we picked it, but we kind of learned about it afterwards, and it's really, I think, a, a key um, concept to understand, especially when managing databases that you really don't want to screw up. They're not just uh, instances you can throw away and, and recreate because there's real data on them, but uh, this idea of item potency Item potency is a, uh, kind of comes from a mathematical or computer science uh, term, but Ansible uh, kind of describes it as you want to define the state that your system, that you want your system to be in, not necessarily the steps along the way. And Ansible and the, the what, what Ansible comes with is the knowledge to um, know if these, if you need to make any changes to get to this state. Uh, if you don't need to make changes, Ansible isn't going to run any extra commands or any extra tasks that don't need to be run. You're not going to end up with um, duplicated you know, databases or users if you rerun the same playbook again and again. Um, it's just going to say, well, that database or that user is already there. Uh, it looks good. It's, it's at the state that you defined it, and uh, we can kind of move on. So before we look at some of the... Ansible 101, just to kind of show you that idea of item potency. Uh, 
We're going to run a, a simple playbook. And if the wireless holds up, we should be able to see. And this is the, the actual commands that are running on the right. What it's going to do is install Postgres, uh, initialize a database cluster, uh, create a database and a user as well. And, and one thing to notice that it's actually running against three instances. Um, and, and just to highlight that Ansible can run things in parallel, but it's also going to ensure that every task is complete before going on to the next one. Um, this is another key thing to, to make sure, like, um, especially with databases and setting up any kind of streaming replication or looking at PG Bouncer or Barman kind of things. Like you want to ensure that um, any prerequisite tasks or that just the order is preserved. So you'll see in the output, like a lot of things have changed. Um, and just to highlight the item potency a little bit, if we rerun it again, you'll see everything's just okay. So when that task is, uh, is run, and so we'll see in that, well, when we look to create the database, it's already there. We don't need to do any more work. Um, so you're not going to drop and recreate anything. Uh, and this is just something that's provided out of the box with Ansible. So let's look at a few uh, kind of core concepts of Ansible. Um, and first off, is anyone here using Ansible right now? Just show of hands. Great. So some, some, some idea of what it is, and uh, that's great. So you know, hopefully this will be a good foundation for those of you who have not heard of it or have not used it um, to kind of at least uh, have, a, have a general understanding of, of the, the basics. So Ansible uses an inventory um, to define all your hosts that you're managing. Um, an inventory actually contains, a, you can set groups of hosts. Uh, highlighted here in blue, so we have a group called Postgres, and there's two instances there, and a uh, barman group and a PG Bouncer group. And then within those groups, we can define the hosts. And, um, and then modules, Ansible uses modules to, uh, to actually do the work that you want it to do. Um, these are included with Ansible out of the box. Uh, last time I checked, there were 523 modules. And uh, these things, they do uh, an, a range of, of tasks, anything from creating uh, EC2 instances at AWS or load balancers or uh, managing you know, Cisco network um, uh, hardware, um, a lot of system utilities to manage uh, services or other things. So, um, and there's also a number of Postgres modules. Uh, here are the, a few that come with Ansible. Uh, you can do things like create and manage your databases, uh, set up privileges or users, and some other ones that um, I think are pretty helpful, uh, template, line and file, shell and service. And we'll, we'll kind of look at those and how they can be used with, uh, when, you're, when you're configuring uh, Postgres. So here's just a simple example, kind of like the previous demo, just, um, just to give you an idea of how the uh, modules would be would be laid out in a in more of a YAML format, um, and again, you know that top line of every module, that name, uh, I think that's a key part of, of being able to document consistently. So if you have that line in there, you kind of know at a high level what's going on, um, which is great just to just to be able to read and, and and document fully what what's going on with your Ansible scripts. So Ansible organizes these modules, and um, and the things that you actually want to do into, into this playbook. Um, and they kind of use this sports analogy um, to define a playbook. Like, uh, you know, there's, there's, it's not just an individual person or an individual task. It's, a, it's, the, it's the orchestration of all these tasks and modules that um, go into defining a playbook. So it's defined in, in the YAML format, um, denoted by the, the three uh, dashes at the top. Playbooks contain one or more plays. So this is highlighted here. This is a single play where we're saying um, the hosts that we want to run against are called PG. Uh, the connection in S is SSH, which is the default. Um, and then uh, within that play, there can be a series of tasks that you want to run against those hosts that you've, 
uh, defined. Ansible also uses variables. Um, variables are great for being able to account for differences between different hosts. So not every host that you manage you know, has the same, uh, maybe not the same version of Postgres or has different um, types of, of software that you want to run on it or different extensions or different databases even. Um, so uh, the, a great way to define variables and one of the um, many ways you can define variables are in your Ansible inventory. Um, so in this example, we have uh, within our inventory directory structure, uh, these are called group variables. So we've named the file to match the group name of the, of the hosts. And uh, so we can have uh, a group called cluster A and a group called cluster B. And cluster A is assigned PG cluster value of A uh, is running version 9.4 and cluster B is running 9.5. Um, so this is um, a way where you can uh, you can run the same set of commands against all these hosts and you know that you're going to install the correct version of Postgres and you're not going to mix up you know, different variables because Ansible is able to, um, to keep track of, of which, which host belongs to which group um, and, and it's a really powerful way to, uh, to define like, the differences between different hosts. So you can also set variables in your playbook itself in a VARS section. And this variable will be um, uh, in, you know, in scope for this entire playbook. Uh, another really great thing with Ansible is that by default it um, gathers what they call system facts. And this is just a short snippet here, but um, there's, uh, there's a lot of things it returns, anything from network configuration to the available memory on the host, um, the distribution of the operating system and the version. And these are all at a host level, so you can check for each host that you're running, even if it's different operating systems, you can know um, and, and can account for those differences. So one way we can use variables, um, when we look at uh, being able to set uh, different memory configurations, we can set by, um, we can use the Ansible mem total to calculate the, the value of different parameters that we want to, to set. Um, and we've used PG Tune as kind of a baseline for this. It seems to be a good starting point at least. And also if you use a variable in a task, you can uh, use this curly bracket kind of format to, to, uh, to use that variable. So this is just a, another example of using that PG version to, um, you know, so we, we know exactly, you know, which version of Postgres we're, we're managing. So another concept that Ansible uh, recommends that people use uh, is this idea of roles. Roles are a logical grouping of tasks that encourages uh, reuse. Um, so you don't have playbooks with just a long list of tasks, um, but you can um, kind of encapsulate like a group of tasks that kind of all do one thing um, within a role. Uh, you can also set um, like default variables for the role and it could have its own set of files or templates that you can use um, when, when configuring uh, your systems. So this is a, a, an example of a playbook that uses roles. Um, so you can see it's a lot cleaner than just a long list of tasks, but um, you know, also like uh, you know, that, that common role, you might be wanting to run that on every single instance that you manage, uh, you know, setting security settings or updating you know, kernels or other um, software packages that you need on your systems. Um, but that Postgres role, you could, um, you probably just want that to run on hosts that you've wanted to, that you want to set Postgres up on. So um, it's just a, a way to have um, just a simpler layout on your playbook. And one thing, um, just a note, I'm using uh, Vagrant for all the, the local demos on my laptop. If you're not familiar with Vagrant, uh, it's a great way to, uh, to manage local VMs on your laptop. Uh, it can use a number of different hypervisors. I'm using VirtualBox, but you can use VMware uh, and a bunch of others. Um, it works great with Ansible. It can actually manage your inventory for you depending on uh, how you've defined um, your Vagrant file. Um, we can take a quick look at this Vagrant environment here. 
So just a Vagrant status, and you can get a list of the different VMs that are running. Vagrant also makes it uh, really easy to SSH to these hosts without setting up any kind of extra you know, SSH keys. Um, it'll create a, a local Vagrant user. Um, and it just simplifies the whole process of, uh, of managing uh, like a small set of VMs on, on your laptop. So let's look a little deeper, um, kind of past the basics, and, and this will be just some quick examples, but maybe a little more practical about um, you know, how we've decided to, to use Ansible to, to configure Postgres. So one thing when you, know to, when you set up Postgres, you've, you've got to do something with PostgresQL.conf. Um, there's a number of variables that um, if you change them, you'll need to either restart or reload Postgres to, um, to actually have those changes go into effect. Um, so to be able to handle that, we use um, this line and file module from Ansible. So this is going to um, look at the, at this variable down here, this PostgreSQL conf restart variable. So these are all, um, all the items that if we change those, we know that we'll need to restart Postgres for that to go into effect. Um, it's, this line in item is gonna loop through those variables. And if it, there's a regxp um, part of that variable, if it matches, if a line matches that regular expression, then it's going to ensure that the line is what we set the value to be uh, in, that, in, the, uh, in the variable itself. And one thing to notice, um, part of uh, Ansible and the idea of item potency as well, is that if, if a change has been made, Ansible will know uh, that a change has been made, obviously, and it will um, notify a special kind of task called a handler. Um, and the handlers are only run when a change has been made or when a module has made a change. If, uh, if no change has been made, it's not gonna call that handler, uh, so it won't, it won't actually uh, run like the restart or reload of Postgres. So this is the handler. In a role, you can set it in its own directory, and Ansible will find it automatically. Um, but again, you know, it's a really powerful way to, to know, um, you know if, if nothing's changed, then we don't need to do any extra work. We don't need additional downtime. Um, so looking into streaming replication, um, you know, the one, uh, you know, there's, there's a few things, you know, a lot of other things that you need to do to, to get this set up. And, uh, but just for the sake of time, we're gonna look at just this one way that Ansible really helps uh, when running long running commands. So if you're running a PG based backup command, depending on the size of your database, uh, it could take hours or even longer. Um, but um, Ansible has a great way for long running tasks to, um, to try to avoid SSH timeouts. You can set uh, async and poll. And uh, what it'll do is async will set the amount of seconds that you want to give this task um, and, and allow it to run for, and poll will set, uh, will just check in that many, every 30 seconds in this example, it'll check in on the task, get a status update on it and say, okay, it's still running, or hey, this failed, or it's finished, and let's move on to the next thing. Um, so it's really nice as a way to kind of avoid any uh, SSH timeout or kind of temporary network connection issue from you know, the machine that you're running on to the host. So looking at now um, Barman, Barman is um, it's a great way to manage your, your backups and recovery scenarios, um, and it's, it's very uh, easy to use when you're configuring it with Ansible. Um, for Barman, we use a template module with Ansible to template out the various uh, files that it needs to be able to know about the different instances and hosts that we, that we wanna manage. Um, in this example, we're, we're actually creating a, um, a config file for every cluster that we want to, every Postgres cluster that we want to manage. Um, and, and this is gonna start using the, the, the system facts that have been gathered. Um, so we don't need to go to each system, find you know, the IP address of the master instance and then copy it and write it down and manually set these, these files up anymore. Um, this is actually gonna loop through um, Every, every host that we've defined to be a master instance and um, run this template file. And this is a, uh, what the template file looks like. This is in the Jinja2 templating format. 
Um, so you can see we're not naming, um, barman doesn't know about the actual host name. We're just gonna name it the, the name of the cluster. So then if we do some sort of uh, failover um, scenario, uh, we won't have a new host that, that barman then doesn't have any backups for. Um, and also you'll see that you know, we're taking advantage of this uh, default IP address and um, using this host vars item that when, when you loop through um, different, uh, like a list of hosts with Ansible, um, you can actually uh, grab ho information about other hosts from another host. So it's, it's kind of, um, they call it magic variables, I think, in Ansible language, but um, it's a really powerful way to, to be able to say, well, we already know the IP addresses of all the other hosts, so let's be able to use them and create dynamic templates on, on the hosts we're managing. So PG Bouncer, you know, um, like Barman, it is not uh, terribly complex to set up. There's a number of, of configuration files, and again, the template module with Ansible works really well for this. Um, one thing that PG Bouncer needs, just one of the configuration files, there's a few others, but um, it, it, it needs a, a list of usernames and passwords that PG Bouncer uses to connect to those other um, Postgres instances. Um, so in this example, and this is, um, this is a little more advanced example of just the Jinja templating format, uh, we're able to loop through all the hosts in this PG master group. Um, and then for each host in that group, we already have defined every database with the username and, a, uh, and an MD5 um, password hash. So the end result is when you look at the user list um, file in PG Bouncer, that we have a list of usernames and passwords uh, that are able to connect to your different hosts. So let's look, um, we'll do a, do a demo here and